Matthew 28. We're going to look at verses 1 through 20. Which means we're reading the chapter. I'm waiting on those pages to quit turning. Friday night we were at a uh, good evening service over at Macedonia Primitive Baptist Church. One of the things that many of the preachers said was, I want you to look at this in your own words, in the, in the Bible there. In the Bible that you have, look at it. So if you have a digital device or the scriptures, look at it that way. Follow along as we read. Now after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came down and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning, and his clothing as white as snow. The guard shook for fear of him and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, just as he said. Come, see the place where he was lying. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. And they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to report it to his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and take word to my brethren to leave for Galilee, and there they will see me. Now, while they were on their way, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priest all that had happened. And when they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers and said, You are to say, His disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this should come to the governor's ear, we will win him over and keep you out of trouble. And they took the money and did as they had been instructed. And this story was widely spread among the Jews, and is to this day. But the eleven disciples proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain with Jesus, which Jesus had designated. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Praise the Lord. Father, I do thank you for your words. I thank you for what we have just read. It is the moment in history that brought everything together. Everything preceding this has been leading to this moment of your resurrection, and everything that we have done since then has been a result of that resurrection, and with a longing toward that day of your second advent, with that longing of the day when you will indeed split the sky wide open, and you will appear once again, but not as the lamb led to slaughter, but as the lion of the tribe of Judah, coming to bring his bride home for the wedding feast of the Lamb. Father, we long for that day and we look for that day. And until that day arrives, we live with the assurance, we live with the confidence, we live with the hope, we live with the surety and a certainty that you indeed will never leave us and that you will never forsake us. And if we have ever truly cried out and said, Lord Jesus, save me a sinner, you have promised to come in and to dwell with us us. We might have a relationship with you, to know you as you have known us. Oh, Father, we say thank you. Father, we glorify you. We exalt you. We praise you. We adore you. You are worthy of that praise. You are God, and you saved us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your goodness, and thank you for your grace, and thank you for your work, and thank you for your victory. And we say all this in your name, Jesus. Amen. 
This morning, I want to talk about some evidence, evidence of the resurrection. So even within this particular passage, you, you, we read here, um, and then I've really, as I started looking at this, I, I put my notes in the wrong order, but we're going to go through the way I've got it so I don't mess up those up there. But I want you to understand that the reason why we know that the evidence of the resurrection is real, the very first thing, if you're to be taking notes this morning, the first thing I want you to understand is that the tomb is empty. It is empty. And it is not a disputed historical fact. No one disputes this historical fact. Not a single one. Josephus, who is just is a Jewish writer, never became a Christ follower as far as we know, identifies that there was an empty tomb. Even here, and part of the reason is because some of what the rumor was, some of what the conversational pieces were. And Matthew gives us some pointings to that when you get over here to verses 11 through 15, which is where you have that account that we just read about where the soldiers go to the priests and tell them what happened, and then the priests say to them, oh, oh, what you need to say is while we were asleep, the disciples came and stole his body. Because they know that they can't deny the empty tomb. Nobody, nobody, historically, no one here in the story, not even among the Jews in their conversational pieces, nobody denies the empty tomb. And what they might argue is stuff like this, foolishness like this, where they say, oh, Jesus swooned and, and he pushed the stone away. Now, just remember about the pushing the stone away. Do you remember in another gospel account with the ladies? Do you remember some of their conversation on the way in to the, to the tomb that morning? They were, what was their conversation piece? When we get there, we've got all the spices, but when we get there, how are we going to move the tomb? This isn't just a little, this isn't a little stone, okay? This is a, this is a, not on that one. It's a big, there was a, one of the pictures we sang with one of the songs. It's a big rock. And you'd have to roll it kind of thing. And it would sit in that place. And they're sitting there going, how are we going to move it? And what, Jesus from the inside is going to do it by himself? If he were just a man? If he were, if he were just an ordinary human being? He's going to do it? No. That's a lie. So then they say, okay, well, then, then his, his disciples came. And they Obviously, they're the ones that stole it away. But it says that these, these guards were asleep. Now, why would these Jewish priests have to say to the guards, hey, if word gets back to the governor, we'll win him over for you? Why is that? Why, is, why do they have to do that? Yeah. Because a Roman guard doesn't fall asleep on his position. Some of you all served in our military. Did any of you all ever have to do guard duty? If you had to do guard duty, raise your hand. Okay? Several of you. Okay, when you did guard duty, okay, when you, when you fell asleep, did they kill you? Oh, you all are alive and you're still in here. So, no. You... The punishment was a little different for a Roman soldier. You fall asleep in Rome, the consequence is, oh, I'm sorry, you're dead. Because we're not going to tolerate that. Just a little different system. Now, you might get in serious trouble today if you fall asleep on your post, but you ain't going to be killed. At least not by your commanding officers, not by your governor. And yet, no one denies the tomb. It is indeed empty. And yet we have all these stories. What are we going to do with them? Which one are you going to believe? Which story are you going to believe? The rhetoric or the truth? Because there is a truth. And the truth is Jesus Christ rose from the dead. That is the truth. The empty tomb. Second evidence. Second evidence. The first day of the week. You might be saying, well, Scott, that's kind of weird. But again, we come back to the text again. Now, after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. This is obviously Sunday morning. And yet for over 3,000 years, the Jewish faith has said you worship God on the 
Sabbath. Even to this day, there's a group of evangelicals who say that we, who meet on Sunday, that we're doing the Lord God a disservice. And they say that the result is that it's a, it's a fictitious thing that came about because of Constantine. That Constantine, who was a, before he was converted, supposedly, was a sun worshiper. And so Constantine is the one who moved the day of worship to Sunday to worship not S-O-N, sun, but S-U-N, sun. That is hogwash. That's the Greek for that word, by the way. That is not at all what happened. We know, we can read through the scriptures that even here at the very beginning, it was the custom of the early church in the writings of the New Testament that they worship on Sunday. It is the reason why, for example, when you get to the book of Revelation and you have John there on the island of Patmos and he's about to receive the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he emphasizes that it was on the Lord's day that he's receiving this as he is worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the custom of the early church. Now, why is this? Now, think about it. Just think, go all the way back. Remember everything that Jesus is doing. What is Jesus doing in this death, burial, and resurrection? What is he doing? He is ushering in this new covenant. He is making all things new as he does. He is redeeming that which the Old Testament could not do. He has fulfilled the law and the prophets. And so as a result of fulfilling those, he is now redeeming them and making them now accessible for you and for me. So now we go all the way back. Back all the way to the beginning. God works for how many days as he's creating the world? Six days. Then... What does he do on the seventh? He rests. But what does he then do on the first day? He starts to work again. So in other words, he created, he rested, he works again. You could say, if you will, that Jesus' greatest work took place in the week of Passion. Yes, he worked three years. And yes, for three years, he was training and molding his disciples. For three years, he was raising them up to understand that he was supposed to suffer and die for the sins of the world. But they never understood it. Then you have the ushering in on Palm Sunday as the entire crowd there is following Jesus and saying, Hosanna to the highest, Hosanna to the highest, Hosanna to the highest. And ushering him as as the king to Israel. They didn't like the type of king he would be. And so he starts preaching on Monday, takes a break Tuesday, preaching Wednesday. And the crowd didn't like what he had to say. And the religious leaders stirred up the crowd. But Jesus is working, and he's working. And then he does his ultimate and final work on Friday. After he has endured false trial, after false trial, after false trial, after he endures the physical torture that he goes through. And far more, by the way, than the physical torture is what he then bore on the cross of Calvary. Because he did it, it, you know, people all the time, we emphasize the, the, the beating that Jesus took. And yes, we ought to know that there was a severe beating. When we say all the time, you know, you know, he did what no one else could do. Yeah, actually, there were two other guys who were on that cross too. They're right beside him. Humanity, Romans had perfected the crucifixion. It wasn't the crucifixion that made the crucifixion so important. It is what Jesus bore on that crucifixion that no other human being ever bore on that crucifixion. And that was the sin of you and me. The Lord God literally poured his wrath onto his very own son and said, you will take that which they cannot save themselves from. That is what makes the crucifixion of Jesus different than everybody else. And so his final act of worship, his final act of work on that Friday on that, was, was to say, it is finished. To tell us die. It is, it is a legal, it, I mean, it's an economic term. It means paid in full. Your sin debt is paid in full. 
Therefore, you no longer, if you are one in Christ, you no longer have to worry about your sin debt. If you are one in Christ, if you've actually cried out and said, Lord Jesus, save me a sinner. If you've done that, you are free and free indeed. And then what does he do? Now, this is a sad kind of way to put it, but he rests, if you will, on that seventh day in the tomb that has been buried. But just as back at creation, when he rises, when the first day comes, what does God begin to do? He begins to work again. What does Jesus do on the first day? Begins to work again, anew. It is significant that the early church recognized what Jesus did to such an extent that they said, we're changing worship names. We are, remember, the early church, the first ones, they're all Jews. The 120 in the upper room are all Jews. And for 3,000 years, the law has told them, keep the Sabbath holy. And for 3,000 years, they've observed it. Now, because of the work of Jesus, because of the resurrection, they say, oh, we're changing. He has made all things new. He, is, he has fulfilled that law, and now we will worship on his glorious day because that day gives us hope. That day gives us a, a, a reason and a purpose because we are now alive in Christ. He is the resurrection and the life. If we are in him, he will resurrect us. So we see the empty tomb. We see the first day of the week. Then even what did we just read out of? What did we just read out of? We just read out of the New Testament. The New Testament is the third answer right there, by the way, for evidence. People say all the time, you know, this again, we're back to, we're back to like the Da Vinci Code by Dan Brown. Yeah, that's a good book right there. But some of you enjoyed the movie because some of you didn't read the book. Um, that's a bunch of crazy talk right there, okay? It ain't true. There ain't nothing true in that book. But what that book is trying to help you, will help you people say, what they're trying to argue, is that everything that you and I believe and everything that we read here happened three and four hundred years after the resurrection. No, 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 it did not. No, it did not. We have first count recordings here. We just now read out of Matthew's gospel. This is actually Matthew's, the disciple, the one who lay in, in this very book is the tax collector that is being written about in here. He's writing his story. He's writing his observation. You move to the next book, it's Mark. Mark, yeah, he was the one who is there at the, at the night in which Jesus was betrayed. He's the one that runs off naked. Why do you think it's in there? Because Mark is sitting there saying it's just a technique that's used in this time period of history. He's sitting there saying, because I was there. This is eyewitness testimony. And then on the parts in which he wasn't there for an eyewitness testimony, who do we know that John Mark went and talked to? Peter. And that's why there's certain accounts in here that only Peter would know about. And so therefore he writes from Peter's perspective. Then you move to the next book, and what you got there, you got Luke, who, what does he tell you right up front at the beginning of his book? As he's writing Theophilus, he's going, oh, oh, I'm writing this as an accurate account of what took place with Jesus Christ, the Nazarene. And then He's going to do the follow-up when he gets to the book of Acts. And he says, you'll remember in my previous letter, now let me tell you what's going on with the church. And he continues to write what happens. And by the way, halfway through that book, what does he do? The pronouns change, don't they? Because those pronouns in the first half of the book were they and them and he. But now it changes to we and us. Why? Because he's a first-person account of what he's seen, heard, and saw. And you can go through, and we know, and this again, this come on, come on, come on. we could nerd out here just a little bit if we could. But there's, there's, like, there's like 200 copies. Don't, this is not the exact numbers, this, but I'm trying to give you guys kind of an understanding. There's like 200 copies of Plato's work. And we go, oh, that's real. That's real. That's, that's, that's authentic. That's Plato's work. We have literally over 10,000 
copies of the New Testament. And what did the world say? Oh, that's not real. That's, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, ancient, that's not real, that's not real, that's fabricated. Are you crazy? 200 over 10,000, 200 over 10,000? It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. The evidence is overwhelming that the New Testament writers, and why did they write? Why did they write? Did they want to? In other words, in other words think about it. If they write these words, what have they just now defined themselves as? They are now traitors to Rome, and they are traitors to the Jewish people. And what is the end result of every single one of these New Testament writers? They are all put to death, except for John. But they tried to do that. They tried to boil him, but that didn't work. So then they exile him to an island to shut him up. And it didn't work there because what did he then write? The Revelation, praise the Lord. Which, by the way, just as a little side note, again, this is one for free. It's the revelation of who? Jesus Christ. It ain't the revelation of the Antichrist. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. So when you're reading the book of Revelation, focus in on who's really the focus of the book. The focus is him. Now, don't get all caught up in all the other stuff. It's about him. Him, that's a side note. That's just free. So the evidence, the mere fact that we are reading the actual words, translated, translated words of what really took place is evidence of the resurrection. Then I want to give one more. And I've already alluded to it. I've already alluded to it in the, when I've explained to you that these disciples, every one of them died at a martyr's death, minus John who was put on the island. But I allude to you that the final evidence of the resurrection is the last part. Why we read verses 16 through 20. Because it says, But the eleven disciples proceeded to the Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had designated. When they saw him, they worshipped him as if some doubt were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always even to the end of the age. This final point, the final evidence that we have as to the resurrection is actually the birth of the early church. I just want you to think about it just for a moment. If it was truly a lie, and the disciples knew that it was a lie, if this was truly the case, I want you to think about that secret meeting in that upper room after Jesus has died. I want you to think about that conversation, how that would have had to go. Hey, guys, we know this is a lie. But I tell you what, we're not going to make any money on this. But we'll go out there and we'll tell the people we will live in poverty and be no home for us. And we'll travel the world. And as we're out there traveling, they're going to stone us. And as we're out there traveling and we're hungry, and we're thirsty. We're going to sometimes be wondering where our clothes are. In some places, they stripped them from them right before they beat them. You remember Paul, Silas, naked in the jail? And they said, now that sounds like a really good deal. And we'll tell other people that we know it's a lie, but, I mean, Jesus rose from the dead. And, and, and follow after us, and they might get beaten too. Sounds like a good plan for evangelism. Come follow us. Enjoy the hardship. Now, do you really think, if it was really that way, if that really is what took place in that upper room, do you really think that all of them would have died? Or do you think one of them, just one of them, just one of them, might have said, right before they're about to be beaten, stoned, killed, cut in half, crucified upside down, don't you think one of them, just one of them, might have said, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> Um, it was, it, we were fooling. It was just a joke. We thought it'd be funny. Please don't kill me. But not a one of them. Not a one of them said that. 
and they all died. Alistair Begg, probably my favorite preacher, said these words about the resurrection and about the early church. He said these words. He says, the experience of Christ in us is built upon a historical moment in time. That was the death, burial, and resurrection, a historical moment in time. It happened. It's not fabrication. It's not a story. It is the history of the event that gives credence to the experience. It is not the experience that is read back to create the event, which is exactly what Dan Brown and the Da Vinci Code and all these other lunatics are saying, is that we are reading back into our theology to make our theology say what it says. So we, and so here it is. So, listen, Alistair Begg is right on target. So we must go out to a world in which meaning is lost. Go out into a world where people do not know who they are. Go out into a world in which the meaning of the story is completely gone because they are lost in their darkness. They are lost in their trespasses and sin. They are lost and do not know that they need a Savior. That's why they're lost. And if this is truly the truth, and if the evidence is truly clear, and it is clear, then we are the only ones with the answer. You're the only one that has a message of hope for the lostness in the world. If you really believe this, then it is our job to do that last part, to do what the believers of the New Testament did. They started the church, and it is our job to continue the church, to perpetuate the church, to proclaim the gospel in season, out of season, ready to give the defense for the hope which is found within us. This is who we are. We are the church. We are the bride of Christ. We are commissioned, not suggested, to go out. And this message is to change our very lives. We are not supposed to just be ones to hear it, read it, and go, oh, wasn't that nice? It isn't just nice. It changes us. Changes us from the very core of who we are. And my faith can't be your faith. This is an individual decision. Yes, we are collectively the body of Christ, but you individually, every one of you individually, your wife can't do it for you, your husband can't do it for you, your mom and dad can't do it for you, your grandparents can't do it for you, even your kids can't do it for you. It has to be your decision. You have to surrender. The scripture says today is the day of salvation. Today is the day in which there is hope because you're not promised a tomorrow. Every one of us know of individuals who suddenly just die unexpectedly for no reasons. And age is an irrelevancy. You do not know what your last day is. And there ain't nothing you're going to do to stop your last day. So because you can't stop your last day, you better be ready. You better be surrendered. You better have given your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ and know that you know that you know. And by the way, I've said this before, it ain't that you prayed a prayer with a preacher. It ain't that you got wet in the baptism pool. It's because the Spirit of God gives you perfect peace and it gives you joy that overflows. If you don't have joy and you don't have peace, I'm telling you, you need to do a faith check. You need to do a gut check. You need to be asking the Holy Spirit, Lord God, am I really yours? And if you don't have that peace and you don't have that joy, telling you today is the day. You better come down this aisle in just a moment. We're going to give you an opportunity. And as we sing and as we sing and we have this invitation, you can come down. And I'd love to share with you one-on-one -on -one how you can know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But it's real simple. It's real simple how you can get saved. You recognize. You say, I am a sinner. I know I've done wrong. And I know I can't clean myself up. I know I can't fix it. I never could. Because if I could have, I would have already done it. But I can't. So because I can't, I need somebody who can. And that's Jesus. So you come to him and you say, Lord Jesus, I, I, I'm a sinner. Come into my heart and cleanse me. Make me new. Remove that old heart of stone and give me a heart of flesh that will beat for you. And he promises that he will. He says he'll give you a brand new heart. In fact, the scripture tells us that you are a new creation at that very moment. You are no longer who you once were. The old is dead. It is gone. 
you are now alive forevermore, new. And at that very moment that you cry out, you've been given eternal life starting right now. And you are now forevermore in a relationship, a relationship where you talk with him, you speak to him, you commune with him, you fellowship with him, you worship him, you sing to him, you serve him, you adore him, you honor him, you love him, you sacrifice for him. You say everything that you want, anything that you need, that is my whole heart devotion is you and you alone, Lord Jesus. You speak to my heart and let me walk in obedience. That is what salvation does within us. And it's not because we feel obligated, but it's because we feel the overwhelming joy of sitting there saying, oh my goodness, I get this opportunity. This is an opportunity. This is a privilege. This is a joy set before me, and I get the opportunity to participate in serving the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you, if you really know, if you've really tasted, tasting, the Bible says taste and see that the Lord is good. If you really have tasted and you really have seen that the Lord is good, you will never, ever, 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 ever get over it. And you're going to want to come back again and again and again and adore him and serve him and not just on Sunday and certainly not just on Easter and not just on Christmas. You're going to want a life of service to him if you really, really are his because he paid it all. What more could we give? What more could we offer the one who saved us from the lake of fire and the pit of eternal suffering forever and ever and ever? And if we really believe this message, and we really don't go share it, what we are saying to a lost world is, I don't really care what happens to you. Go spend eternity in the lake of fire. That's fine. If we really do care, we will tell other people about the love of Jesus Christ. And by the way, we're living in a world where they look at that and they go, oh, we don't like your kind of love. Well, love is love. And the first thing a lost person needs to understand is that they are sinners, lost, in need of grace. And we tell them the truth. And when we told them the truth, we pray and we hope, and we believe by faith that the Holy Spirit will do something supernatural in their heart and birth within them life that comes from family in Jesus Christ. As, the, as they cry out, Lord Jesus, save me a sinner. The evidence is before us. The evidence is clear. And you have to literally, and by the way, we just gave four pieces of evidence from this passage. The evidence is far more than just four pieces. Josh McDowell, back in the 70s, wrote a two-volume book that's over a 1,000 pages called The Evidence That Demands a Verdict. If you want to read about some evidence, I got a 1,000-page book back there you can borrow. Over 300-something prophetic voices in the Old Testament had to be fulfilled, every single one of them, and Jesus didn't. If one of those didn't happen, Jesus is not the Messiah, and they all became lies. One piece of evidence now is outside of this place. And we could go on and on and on and on. What will you do with the evidence? What will you do with Jesus? Father, we surrender this day to you. We glorify you that this is Resurrection Sunday. We exalt you for being the Savior who changes us, who redeems us who bought us. We are no longer our own. We were bought with a price. Therefore, Father, we want to honor you. You've literally, you, you've come to dwell within us. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit if we are indeed yours. And as a result, we should have a life that shows a distinction. We have a life that shows there is something different about us, the way that we, we, the way that we work, the way that we live, the way that we parent, the way that we forgive, the way that we show mercy and grace the way that we unify ourselves. Father, this is your time. It has all been your time. It has been your time this entire morning to draw on the hearts of those who are here. Father, there's not a single person here by accident. Some are here thinking they're here just for their mom or their dad or their grandma or their grandpa. Some think they're here for their brothers or sisters. Some think they're here just for their neighbors. But, Father, there's not a single person here that is here by accident. Today was the day that they were to hear these evidences. 
And we are asking that you would do what only you can do as you draw on their hearts and help them to have the strength and the courage to stand up here in this moment, to walk these aisles, and to give their life to Jesus Christ. Father, be glorified this day in this place. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.